This lecture concludes our unit on substance use and misuse by focusing on uh, treatment approaches to substance use disorders. When we talk about treating substance use disorders, one of the things we need to point out up front is that it's complicated. Uh, given the varieties of ways in which people can pr present with substance use disorders and the um, histories of those and the problems that may co-occur, we need to have flexible and varying approaches. There is really no one way to describe what substance use treatment looks like. There's a variety of ways that it may uh, look different. Uh, some of the different ways that it may vary includes things like modes of delivery. Uh, much of substance use treatment is self-help. One of the most popular treatment approaches in America, Alcoholics Anonymous, is, is actually a self-help or sort of co-self-help approach. It doesn't involve professionals. Uh, treatment can involve individuals or groups. Um, the most common type of professional treatment is group type approaches, mostly because they're more cost effective and economical. Treatments can involve the family versus the individual, and even uh, treatment can be delivered online. Treatment can occur in very different settings. Um, some treatment occurs in inpatient settings where people may be supervised in a hospital-like uh, setting, or it may be outpatient. Outpatient treatment can further vary by being either intensive, meaning perhaps it occurs every single day or for most of the day every day. That's what we consider very intense outpatient. Or it can be occasional, where people maybe only present for treatment a few days a week or once a week. Treatment can also be residential. Much of the treatments you see on television and in movies involves residential treatment. This is typically reserved for people who have a fairly severe substance dependence problem uh, and the means to afford residential treatment. In residential treatment, people go to a place to live for anywhere from 28 days to a few months where they can establish some stability with a sober lifestyle before beginning to incorporate that into their real life in the real world. Substance use treatments may vary in their targets. Uh, most focus on abstinence or sobriety, complete sobriety, as the chief goal. Uh, others focus more on moderation, and moderation might be a target where uh, somebody without such an intense problem may need to learn the skills to use their substance in a less frequent, less intense way to prevent associated problems. Some treatments focus more on harm reduction. They may not even focus on stopping the substance use at all, but focus more on trying to prevent some uh, uh, sort of ancillary behaviors people may engage in that put themselves at harm uh, for either their health or their safety or other sorts of issues. Some treatments focus more on the comorbid conditions. We know that substance use disorders co-occur with things like mood disorders or anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder are highly comorbid, and some treatments focus more on those co-occurring disorders and less so, um, or perhaps equally so, with the substance use treatment. And also, they can vary on whether the goal is detoxification, which is typically a short-term treatment involved with just trying to get people to um, be sort of medically stable without the substance on board versus maintenance of those goals over time, and that's usually a longer-term treatment experience that has that kind of a goal. Uh, treatments can vary in what strategies they may use, and we'll touch on some of these um, in a few slides. And lastly, they may vary in their modality. Uh, some use behavior therapy, uh, typically guided by a professional, uh, like a substance use counselor or a psychologist. Others may use peer support, like Alcoholics Anonymous. Also, pharmacology or, or phar pharmacotherapeutic agents can be used, and we'll talk about those in a few slides as well. Most common with uh, modern approaches to substance use treatments, you'll see combinations of these approaches. Um, we know that if any of these are effective by themselves, uh, we like to sort of throw as much as we can at a problem so we can have the best chance of addressing it. So many treatment plans at most treatment agencies will include some combination of all of these different approaches. This figure here is one from a treatment approach called relapse prevention. In relapse prevention, it is a behavioral treatment that's main goal is to try to prevent uh, relapsing back to old habits. What this figure is meant to illustrate is that there are lots of opportunities to intervene in that process uh, between when somebody is sober and an actual lapse that leads to relapse. Typically, long before somebody experiences a lapse that puts them at risk for relapse, they're experiencing what we might call a lifestyle imbalance and a desire for indulgence. Their life may be missing something. It may be missing some satisfaction, maybe missing some fun, um, maybe missing some social interactivity. 
And one of the things that we might try to do is try to help people learn to live a satisfying, fulfilling life without the substance as a way of preventing this sort of background risk factor. When people have that desire for indulgence, that can lead to urges and cravings. And we can train people to cope with those urges using things like med meditation, or we can perhaps train people in stimulus control techniques to try to remove some of the risk factors or the cues in the environment that lead to urges and cravings. When people have urges and cravings, the next step may be rationalization, denial, and what are called uh, apparently irrelevant decisions. This is kind of cognitive content, and with that we might be able to teach people how to think about these situations differently, how to um, help them identify when these kinds of thoughts and beliefs are occurring that put them at risk, and try to get themselves on a different path. Really at any point in this flow from left to right across Miller's figure, Interventions are available to try to get people off the path. Typically, we try to intervene farther to the left because the farther we get to the right, the harder it is to get off that sort of slippery slope on the way to lapse and relapse. In the middle there, you see people may find themselves in high-risk situations. Uh, these can put people particularly at risk where they might not have an opportunity to, um, uh, to get off this slippery slope. So we might train people to um, uh, avoid those kinds of situations or to use self-monitoring and behavioral assessment to try to identify what, what situations would be almost impossible for them to get out of. If people don't have an adequate coping response, and one opportunity for intervention is to train people in coping skills at this point, but if they don't cope effectively, they may experience a decrease in self-efficacy, and they may have what are called positive outcome expectancies of the substance. So at this point, the user is thinking, um, well, I... Um, I'm feeling pretty miserable, this situation is terrible, the only thing that might help is use. Well, that's a positive outcome expectancy that we might be able to challenge uh, with some education and some uh, work targeting those kinds of myths. Uh, that may lead to people initially using that substance. That initial use of substance is not a relapse, that's what we call a lapse. A lapse is a single one-time slip up or use for somebody who is otherwise trying to maintain sobriety. It's not a full-blown relapse until it is repeated and people are sort of slipping back into the old daily habits. So even at that moment of that one slip up, we might be able to use some, some coping skills uh, to try to realize that's a lapse. Um, unfortunate, but not the end of the world. Get back into treatment and get back towards my goal of sobriety. After that initial substance use, there's a cognitive phenomenon called the abstinence violation effect. With the abstinence violation effect, what happens is that people experience decreased self-efficacy and confidence and, and sort of a what-the-hell attitude once they've had that initial lapse, and that puts them at risk for slipping back into those repeated old habits. Well, we can counter that abstinence violation effect with some cognitive restructuring as well to say, listen, a lapse is not a relapse. A lapse is one slip up. It's not really that big of a problem unless you let it go even farther. And so we try to cut it off at that point. So as you can see here, when people uh, uh, who are trying to maintain sobriety experience lapses, there's a variety of different steps in that process, and each of those steps gives us an opportunity to intervene uh, with treatment. As far as some of the general principles of treatment I would share to you, there's four general models of effective behavioral therapies for um, uh, drug and alcohol issues. Uh, the first are brief and motivational models. These are typically focused on trying to build a sense of commitment and intrinsic motivation uh, for the user to be committed to change. Uh, the second are what are called contingency management models. These are treatment approaches that focus on trying to uh, strengthen the reinforcing uh, properties of the alternatives of a sober lifestyle and perhaps increase the punishing consequences of uh, use. There's also skills training and what are called cognitive behavioral models. The relapse prevention model I just showed you is an example of a skills training approach. This tries to focus on strengthening an individual's skills to cope with life and to maintain sobriety and prevent relapse. Fourth are, are treatments that focus more on the social aspects of treatment. They try to build the social environment to use social support networks and families uh, to try to support uh, sobriety over time. All of these four general models are thought of as a way of sort of shoring up the brakes and trying to interfere with compulsive and habitual use. There's other approaches like using adjunctive pharmacotherapies that may be useful at helping us take the foot off the gas, another way to slow down um, a runaway uh, car, uh, by reducing the brain's hunger for the substance, and we'll turn to those alternatives next. 
Pharmacotherapy is a relatively recent area of sort of exciting in innovation in trying to treat substance use, and it's somewhat controversial. Um, in the uh, drug uh, treatment world, you might hear people talk about trying to avoid trading one drug for another. And so sometimes people downplay um, uh, the potential of medications as being helpful at treating uh, substance use disorders. I think those people are really uh, off the mark and the science doesn't support that. Pharmacolo pharmacological treatments can be very helpful for many people and I hope that uh, the sort of worldview shifts a little bit towards realizing this can be a useful treatment adjunct. Pharmacological adjuncts or PAs serve one of two broad goals. One is they may be useful for reducing or managing acute withdrawal. For people who are in de detoxification treatment episodes, remember those are typically two to three days. The goal is just simply to achieve sort of medical stability as one withdraws from a substance. Um, and there may be some medicines used there to try to help people um, be as comfortable as possible during that process or to counteract some of the effects of the withdrawal syndrome. Other PAs try to aid in the prevention of relapse and support sustained abstinence. And that's what I'll focus a bit more on. Pharmacological adjuncts take many forms. Uh, one could be drug replacement delivery systems that deliver the same drug but in safer forms. For example, for people trying to stop smoking, there are alternatives to get nicotine in their system using much more safer delivery than smoking of tobacco. For example, nicotine patches or gums provide a much safer means of delivery of the substance. Now, people will still be dependent on the nicotine, but they're getting it in a much safer way. And that may be an important step towards ultimate um, quitting of tobacco use altogether. There can also be what are called agonist replacements. Um, these are drugs that uh, directly stimulate the same receptor for the drug and try to occupy the neural receptors where that drug may have its pharmacological effect. One example of this is a drug called methadone that is often used in the treatment of people who are dependent on heroin or opiates. What methadone does is a long-acting drug that interacts over a long period of time, say 24 hours, with the same um, uh, receptors on the neurons where heroin or other opiates might interact. By occupying those receptors using heroin or opiates, there's no point to it because one won't experience the effects of that. And in fact, they might actually get sick from that. Um, methadone itself, the advantage is it doesn't create any kind of a high. And so people can still go to their jobs, they can live with their families, and live a much healthier lifestyle. Now they still have to continue taking the methadone every day, and that's not ideal. Uh, but ultimately this may be an important step to folks moving uh, a step on the way to ultimate sobriety from heroin and other opiates. And certainly a much safer lifestyle than using heroin itself. There also may be what are called indirect agonists that stimulate receptors upstream uh, from where the drug may have its interactions, but it may prevent the effects of that drug. There's a drug called naltrexone or Trexan. What it does is prevents the high that people experience when they take opiates like heroin. Um, now it doesn't do that by directly interacting with, with the same uh, receptors that heroin interacts with, like methadone does. It actually uh, interferes with the process by which that interaction is translated into a high experience in the brain and prevents that high. Downside in naltrexone, and for many uh, pharmacological adjuncts, is it's very hard to get ones that are specific enough that they prevent the high from the drug, but they don't also prevent highs from naturally occurring things. That's a real downside of a drug like naltrexone, is that many of these folks just simply aren't experiencing highs ever in their life. They just don't feel much. They feel very numb, uh, because the naltrexone is not only preventing a high from heroin, it's preventing most other ex uh, experiences of euphoria or highs from natural living. This is an area of exciting developments uh, right now, and so we may see a lot of things develop with pharmacological agents over time related to drug, drug use. Of course, with the prevalence of SUDs, there's an economic opportunity for drug companies, so there's, that's why it's an area of high innovation. There are some exciting new approaches that are like vaccines that try to use the body's own immune system to attach antibodies to drug molecules like the alcohol or heroin molecule that actually prevents it from crossing the blood-brain barrier. By connecting an antibody to those molecules, they become too large to cross the blood-brain barrier, interact with the nervous system, and have that effect. Can you imagine if we had a vaccine somebody could take? that would prevent alcohol from ever creating a sense of euphoria without any, having any other sorts of side effects. That could be a huge advance. There are companies working on that right now. 
we're of course learning an awful lot as we learn about, we're learning so much about the brain in general these days, but we're also learning about the neuromechanisms of drug action that could continue to yield other innovative approaches over time. The challenge, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is really how to create drugs that, um, that do the job we need as far as uh, intervening with the action of, of a drug of abuse, but don't also have unfortunate side effects that make them intolerable or ones that people just can't live with over time. So that concludes our brief overview of a variety of different approaches to dealing with substance use disorders.